So a little bit in terms of the context on the night, I want to show, uh, share with you. I'm going to read you a quote that I think encapsulates kind of what the message is all about and what I, I desire to share. Since the beginning of time, humanity developed through the power of collective knowledge. A person isolated from all other human contact will only know what he himself experiences. But when we can pass information along and learn from one another, it's possible to develop more quickly as a society because each ensuing generation begins with the previous body of knowledge as a base from which to work. And if you look at life as an hourglass, you can say at the top is the time that we still have yet to spend, right? The opportunity that we can invest in the days ahead. And you took, take a look at the sands at the bottom, and that's the experiences that we've encountered, the experiences that we've learned from. You can invest your own experiences back into the top to shape the decisions that you make and how you trade your time in the future. But more collectively, if we can, as a society, as a, as a community, share the experiences from the bottom collectively with one another, we can invest in a way that might lead to what we're all seeking, which I would argue is life fully alive. And so that's kind of the backdrop of that. And I have to confess, this is a really strange uh, uh, setting in, in some respects, mainly because uh, there's so many of you that are sitting there that had that impact in my life. And I would envision if I shared this message or had the opportunity to share this message and this framework for living life to the fullest somewhere else, it would be probably with familiar faces that I, or not familiar faces, people I did not know. And so it's a little bit different standing up here in front of people that have actually had this investment in my life, but I felt the desire to share it here in our own backyard first because that was how I said thanks to all of you. So that's the context. So what's the goals for the evening? Goals for the evening is threefold. That you would gain a valuable perspective for finding or maybe validating authenticity that you're living in your own life. Or maybe, hey, I'm living really authentically in these areas of my life, who I truly am. But over here, there's some opportunities for me to live more authentically and live more fully alive as a result. That you might identify a specific actionable step that you can take in some of those areas. And ultimately, that you could provide me some feedback, uh, feedback on this framework to be able to make it more valuable for others that we might share it with in the future. In terms of the agenda, um, kind of here's the, the, the outline for the night. Um, we, we've kind of advertised it five to seven. I'm not going to talk for two hours straight. Um, as much as I would love that, because that's a sweet spot for me. <laughs> Captive audience, two hours. You guys are all far too polite to walk out in the middle. <laughs> That's like, that, it should, shouldn't be Scott's birthday, that's my birthday. <laughs> but here's where we're going. Uh, I'm going to give us kind of a context. I call it a call to something big. Then we're going to go through four steps. We're going to gain worldly perspective. We're going to gain self-perspective. We're going to gain authenticity. And then we're going to gain significance. And then we're going to tie it together. And then we're going to break cuddle. And we're going to go uh, enjoy camaraderie on the, on the patio with one another. All of you should have picked up a pamphlet with uh, like a folder with a bunch of worksheets in it. Um, there's a little button that says take action on a few of these slides. No, I promise I won't call you out. There's no test at the end of this, okay? However, there is a, an attempt on my part to make this something that's applicable to you. In other words, this framework is really important, is, as I'll share in a second, I've cobbled this together from actually the investments that people have made in my own life. This is not all, all my thinking. It's not stuff that I just sat in some dark corner of a room, thought up, put on paper, and now I'm soaking up two hours of your life to share it with. The reality is most of you, in many ways, have shaped that in my own life as I've gone on that journey. So what I've come to find is the framework I've put together is a series of questions. It's a reflection that is something we have to answer for ourselves, because what's authentic to you is not necessarily what's authentic to me. So I'm not going to tell you what the answers are in this. I'm going to ask and put you through a framework that will allow you to do that for yourself. So we're going to have a few spots throughout the time tonight that will take action. We'll pause for five minutes, and you guys can fill out a few of the worksheets for yourself in confidence there in the future. Any questions? Make sense? Everybody with me? Yes. Okay. So let's kick this off. I believe that it's not dying that people are afraid of. Something else. Something more tragic than dying frightens us. We're afraid of never having lived of coming to the end of our days with the sense that we were never really alive, that we never figured out what life was really for. I think all of us can relate in some respects to this desire to say, well, what path is right for us in life? And I'm sure at, at various stages of our life as we look back, whether we're a, a high school age, college age, with the new freedoms of life that that provides, you know, trying to direct traffic. I get a lot of students in my office that have these newfound freedoms and are trying to sort out their life. But 
even if it's my parents' age and they're baby boomers that are retiring and they're trying to figure out the trajectory of their life in this next chapter, this question is something that follows us throughout our days. And so I think this framework is something that has applicability if we're desiring to have that answer. Because we trade time to live life, time is ultimately the most important currency, I would argue. In fact, I would say it's the only truly global currency. I love this quote by Harvey McKay. It says, time is free, but it's priceless. You can't own it, but you can use it. You can't keep it, but you can spend it. Once you've lost it, you can never get it back. And what's interesting about that is, many of you love sports. How many love sports? Sports is a great analogy for life, right? That's why so many of us put our kids through those, those youth sports, life lessons, things of that sort. One of the best games I ever watched uh, live as a, a football fan took place in Denver in 1998. Little backstory. The Broncos at the time were 12 and 0. No NFL team had gone undefeated since the 1972 Dolphins. And as they approached the 13th week out of 16, people started talking, could they pull off an undefeated season? So we were at the game and the Broncos were down 31-21 in the fourth quarter. And all of a sudden, even though we were a running team, quote unquote, timeouts started to be conserved. We started calling timeouts to preserve the clock. We abandoned the running game, we start throwing the ball. Why? Because sports, when you bind it with this time, makes it interesting. We're gonna run out of time and let's see who's on the top of the scoreboard at the end. Well, if a simple game of football is such that we call timeouts, that we back up and ask our coach to give us some perspective on things so we can make the right determination on how to use those waning minutes at the end of the game, why wouldn't we do the same thing with our life, right? Henry David Thoreau, great quote on this, the price of anything is the amount of life that you exchange for it. The price of anything is the amount of life that you will exchange for it. So therefore, I would say, it follows that whatever we trade time for should be of great value. Right? We might consciously choose to blow some time on things, and that's great. We need that as part of a healthy human being. But whatever we ultimately are trading time for should be of great value. And I would argue it's got to be of value that would answer that question of, for you, are you living life to the fullest? So, therefore, it follows that success must be life fully alive, right? If I can achieve success in my life, however that I define it, that must mean that I've been living fully alive, right? Peace joy, contentment, happiness, adventure, all these fun things. I thought if you can just find success, it answers all the questions. I thought that until one night I was in Shanghai, China. My first job out of uh, college, I worked for a Fortune 500 company, 500 offices, 126 countries. Had the unique opportunity as a young punk upstart to go present at one of our worldwide meetings. This one was in Shanghai. I was 23, 24 years old maybe, um, really applying myself in my career, and uh, had a chance to do that. I was probably a decade younger than most of the folks that were in that room. And that night we were going on a bus with the executive committee to the Bund by the iconic uh, you know, space needle looking thing there in Shanghai. And I had the opportunity to sit in the back of the bus with the CEO of the company. CEO of the company, seven figure compensation plan, corporate jet, assistance and support staff that would tend to their every need, managed over 30,000 people globally, knew top government officials on a first-name basis, and rubbed elbows with captain of industry. If anybody embodied the success I was aiming for, it was this guy, right? So we started talking. We were talking in the back of this bus, and he was asking about my background, and no, I didn't go to Ivy League schools. You really stayed in the West Coast. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I did all these things, right? And, and we started talking, and, and one thing turned to another. He asked about my family. I said, well, I'm dating a gal, but we're not married yet, and, and so on and so forth. And then I flipped the table on him. And it was really interesting. I said, how about your family? And he turned to me. Meanwhile, keeping in mind that I think that this guy kind of comes close to walking on water in terms of embodying that success. He says, well, you know, um, I was married and I had two kids, uh, but I was gone a lot. And, you know, my marriage basically has failed. And my kids grew up while I was tending to other things that I was doing. And they have adult lives now, and because I wasn't a part of it then, it's not bitter, but they just don't really care if I'm a part of it now. And I thought, wow. And all of a sudden, could that really be success? How can you feel so high and climb to such heights on one element of life and feel so empty on other fronts? And it, was, it, it, it blew my whole conception of what success was all about. So I said, you know what? I've got to answer this. I've got to figure this out. Success was not what I had thought. 
I needed some sort of framework to be able to figure out how do I live life to the fullest and avoid those pitfalls. I was not passing judgment on this individual. I didn't know him from Adam. I didn't. But I sensed just in my interpretation of our discussion that he had regrets about that. I didn't ask him if he did, but I sensed it. And so rather than anything about him, it was about me saying, I don't want to have those regrets when I get to that stage. So how do I deal with that? How do I avoid that? The path I found, I went on this big journey. Literally, it was about a decade-long journey. And I went and I talked to anybody and everybody that would talk to me, people that were further along in life, behind me in life. I tried new things, um, you know, reading literature, watching these documentaries, but anything and everything that I could do to feed myself with, what is the wisdom that's out there that I can use to try to avoid these pitfalls. And so what I gained, or was, uh, what I put or cobbled together was this framework that I'm going to take through uh, you guys through tonight. Four steps. First, gaining worldly perspective. I call it gaining worldly perspective because at the end of the day, we live in the world. We can't change our field of play. That's where we all spend our time. So we need to recognize the beauty that it has and the amazing things that it represents, but I think at the same time, we also need to recognize the temptations and the challenges that that provides. Second step, we need to gain self-perspective. We need to know who we truly are, and we also need to know who we truly want to be, because oftentimes there's a gap even between those two things that we need to kind of close. Third, once we know what we really are about and what we desire to be, we need to impose our will in the world. In other words, not let the world answer those questions for us, but be authentically who we are in our field of play. And then last, I think ultimately, while I was chasing success, I found out some important lessons about the difference between getting and giving, and found ultimately that maybe significance was what I was actually chasing under a different title the whole time. So once I gained that perspective, the idea was, now I had the view, like you climb a mountain, you can look down and you can see where you travel, and you go, you know what? Now I've got the ability to choose if I desire to live authentically, to live authentically to who I am, because I've got the perspective now to do it. And you might say, why authentic living? What's the importance of that? Why that word? Well, I would argue that authentic living is living life to the fullest. Being true to who you really are and making decisions and path, choosing paths in your life that are consistent with that. It's kind of cool. If you're your authentic self, you have no competition. I mean, makes sense. But let me give a, a more basic example. How many of you can't stand the cost of replacing cartridges and ink on a brain? <laughs> I knew George Garrison. <laughs> so what do you do? You go to Costco and say, hey, I'm going to go get these refills. Ten bucks, eight bucks, and I put them in. And every time, what does it say on my printer? Authentic HP cartridge needed. Are you kidding me? I got five or six of these things sitting there thinking that the next one will be the time I can save it, only to have to go back and buy those three packs for 60 or 70 bucks, right? So look. If a simple printer won't accept an inauthentic cartridge, why are we living lives that might be inauthentic, okay? So let's talk this through. Ultimately, the questions I wanna, I wanna part with you guys throughout the night are, what are you trading your time for in your life? Are you living life to the fullest as a result? I would argue, from looking at my own life, that you probably have a mixed answer on that. There's some areas of your life that you're probably living really authentic. And then there's probably some areas of your life that maybe you're living a little bit less so. My hope would be that as I offer up this framework and you try it on and answer the questions that we go through, that you might find something of value for you. The rewards are worth it, um, and gaining perspective can lead you there. Um, the result is living life to the fullest. Shall we go? Yeah. All right. So gaining worldly perspective. I'm a big movie buff. How many like movies? Yeah, I love Armageddon, right? The existence of mankind is at stake. I love the idea of, uh, uh, of you know, good versus bad and, and things like that. Or the underdog stories like Rudy. And this is a less often talked about movie, but one that I really enjoy. It's called Meet Joe Black. Who's seen the movie Meet Joe Black? Anyone? Okay, for those of you that haven't, let me set a context for you. The guy on the left is uh, Anthony Hopkins, and he plays the role of a media mogul that owns a communications company. He's in his mid-60s. The guy on the right, Brad Pitt, he is coming as the angel of death in the movie, okay? And Brad Pitt's character comes to basically make Anthony Hopkins' character face his fate. But it's this, this movie that takes place over the three, four weeks, this undefined period of time where they have this funny interaction as he gets his affairs in order. And there's a really poignant scene at the end of the movie that I think encapsulates a lot of this stuff. And he says, 
Anthony Hopkins is at this 65th birthday party that's thrown in his honor, and he's backing up, and he's walking up to this hillside where Brad Pitt's character is looking down and seeing and taking in all these scenes. And Hopkins turns to him and says, you know, looking at it, he's, he's, it's hard to let go, isn't it? And Brad Pitt's character is standing there and just looking, and he says, yes, it is, Bill. And Hopkins' character turns back to him and says, and that's life. What can I tell you? And it talks and it embodies the beauty of life. This character that's supposed to take life from this other gentleman came in and it was observing the world for the first time and saw the beauty and the amazing uh, relationships and love that can be part of it. Yet many times we live life and we're jaded by the fact that we've lived in it the whole time. Pitt's character came in and three weeks later he was out. I've lived in it 36 years, you've lived in it less or more, but you've all lived through your life as you've seen it. So oftentimes we can become jaded over time. We might need to step back to our childhood to think of a time when we actually viewed the world maybe a little bit more purely, a little less jaded, a little bit less framed by the world. So think back on your childhood for a second. To a time maybe where when you stood really, really still, when you're playing hide and go seek, you thought if you stood still enough, even though you're in plain sight, nobody could see you. Or when you dealt with a situation where you had a plastic jack-o'-lantern and all it took was filling it with candy to make your life complete. Or you had the 64 box of Crayola crayons and nobody really wanted to, to, to be the first one to mark the ends of it because you didn't want to disturb the perfect box. These are all things thinking back on childhood, right? Amazing times, uh, dreams and aspirations and things along those lines. But then life set in, and I don't know about you, but for me, third grade turned into fourth, to fifth, to sixth, to junior high school, then to high school, and literally it flew by. And before I knew it, um, I was in the working world. And this little boy had become this guy that now put on uh, dress pants and a shirt and everything else. And all of a sudden, all the possibilities that childhood represented, you could be the President of the United States, or go to NASA, or this or that. I was a financial analyst in Irvine, California, working at that desk with that computer doing that thing. And it seemed narrowing to me. And all of a sudden, you looked at it and you go, wow. Was, I mean, it was on the scale of the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus for me. Like when you found out those things weren't quite what they were represented to be. So I felt this stomping of dreams, right? And I'm like, gosh, is this really what it's all about? Ultimately, it was interesting is that became reality. And so I think I started to look to the world to mourn those dreams. As you look back on your childhood and look into adulthood, is there a mourning of dreams that may not come to pass that you're filling with other things, perhaps? That you might be filling with things of the world? I know in my life that's what it was about. I filled them with paths of this world instead. Literally things. Looking to the world to answer the questions. Well, geez, I guess somehow this, this abundant childhood and all these possibilities got narrowed. I guess I can just consume my way out of it. Looking to the world for affirmation of who I was and the path I was choosing to take. Broadly speaking, I say that these would be characterized into two different buckets. I call them life's invitations and life's complicating factors. We go through each real quickly. The invitations are basically the choices in life that we choose to accept. I chose to get married. Melanie chose to marry me. It's a great thing, but it has responsibilities that come with it. We decided to become parents. Again, an amazing thing, but it has responsibilities. These are all different invitations that as we matriculate through life, we can choose and we can pick. And they have amazing, amazing opportunities that come with them, but they also can bring other elements to them, right? They're priorities, but they're also competing. Ever get two invitations to the same party, or to a different party, I should say, and to uh, have to make a choice? Or maybe you tried to do the splits and go to both, and you kind of short-circuited them both. Ever feel like that in life? To make it even more challenging, I think we're more impacted maybe by the media than ever before. Uh, I was recently at a, a basketball game, and keep in mind, in a pro basketball game, the hoop is part of the actual field of play. There were four advertisements on one hoop. Everything's been commercialized. That's not a bad thing. I'm a capitalist. I make my living being a capitalist, teaching in a business school. Okay? But at the end of the day, it's interesting. So the point I guess I'm making is, things like these themes were often coming and being trumpeted in my head. Success is materialism. He who dies with the most toys wins. Constantly upgrading, bigger is better. Pop culture, success is being rich and famous. These are the things that I was trying to get my bearings following this, this episode in Shanghai. I was trying to figure out, how do I navigate my way through all this? The effect is, to be successful, we must consume that product or service. That's the job of a marketer is to be able to present their products so that the value is in the consumption of the product or service. And many times it can be for our good, and maybe it isn't. 
a personal experience with materialism was I'm trained in finance. Uh, and so ultimately, I continued to be somebody that invested and was looking at, at numbers all the time. And everything and anything I did in my life to make decisions was based on return on investment. Slowly but surely, it just became the way I did everything. And my heart started to become kind of a secondary thing, and I started to become more of just a rote machine in the way I analyzed the decisions that came at me in life. We'll talk a little bit about that a little later. John Wooden, um, the famed coach uh, from UCLA that's now passed on, once said, what disappoints him most when he looks around America? And he said this, that's easy. There's simply more emphasis on material things than in years gone by. I think I see it in business, and I think I see it in the home life. So, here's where I want to pause for a second, and now it's your turn, I won't call on you. Go ahead and open up your packet. What I'd like you to spend just a couple minutes, two to three minutes doing, doesn't have to be completed tonight, but I want you to, again, kind of, we're going to kick it off. Write down a few of the things that are the invitations or the obligations that you've signed up for in life, and I've kind of given you five different dimensions to play with, if it helps. And then, what are some of the complicating factors? Specifically, I call them out as temptations or fears. For me, my fear, financially, was not having enough. So I, everything I did was about finances, even though I had no clue what I needed the finances for. Okay? So go ahead and take a few minutes, and why don't you fill that out, and we'll circle back. All right, while you're finishing up, I want to read a couple of quotes to you. This one's by C.S. Lewis. It's, a, it's in a great book by Randy Elkhorn called The Treasure Principle, and I love this quote. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition with infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. How about this one? Steve Jobs said, Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is the living the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' uh, opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. Sounds to me like we better get to know ourselves, huh? Gaining self-perspective. So we've, we live in this world, that's our field of play, it's, it's where we have to live our lives, but the world is not who we are. And so the second step is going to be an effort and that's looking at gaining self-perspective and really identifying who are we truly. Ever taken something at face value without ever questioning it? These are kind of hokey, but follow me on this, we'll have a little fun. Why do croutons come in airtight packages? Aren't they just stale bread to begin with? <laughs> If people from Poland are called Poles, then why aren't people from Holland called Holes? <laughs> Probably because it would be pretty rude, right? Why is a person who plays a piano called a pianist, but a person who drives a race car is not called a racist? <laughs> or my personal favorite, being in the finance trade, why do banks charge a fee due to insufficient funds when they know you're already broke? <laughs> Ultimately, these, these are things that exemplify that sometimes we just take life at face value the way that it is. And while that's a good thing in many ways, sometimes it can be a detriment to us really thinking critically about which path is best for us to choose in life. In other words, we might aimlessly find ourselves on the wrong one. Um, these are called, in, in John Eldridge's books, uh, he calls them agreements. He calls them contracts or agreements that are made. Um, but I've also called them here a societal on-ramp. And being a college professor, let me offer just a quick anecdote about that. I had the opportunity, a unique opportunity, to see a number of students kind of matriculating through both undergraduate and graduate studies. Many of them have a real clear idea of where they want to go, and many have no clue where they want to go, but are using college as the opportunity to find that answer. But then there are some that have simply come there because it was the next logical step. It was the next societal on-ramp. Well, it's a 15-lane highway, everybody else is on it, so I suppose I should just get on to pretty expensive these days to be able to choose that decision if that's the, the mindset. But I think the answer I'm getting at is asking the questions why in life matters. It matters to say, hey, you know what, I'm going to school even if I have no clue because I'm going to use it as an opportunity to discover myself and find out, good, that's good enough, right? But I think when we aimlessly follow what I would call societal on ramps, sometimes we end up in places that we think will lead somewhere that they don't. So, the way to gain self-perspective, at least that I've pushed a piece together for us here, is in dreams and aspirations, interests and passions and skills and talents. 
In other words, I believe you guys are all uniquely hardwired with these things that vary from person to person. That's what makes us all unique. So let's kind of explore these. So let's start with dreams and aspirations, right? Uh, as a little kid, no, I did not want to be a fighter pilot. In fact, quick story, uh, I don't know how old I was, but my parents took me to see Top Gun, and I come out of the Top Gun uh, uh, you know, the movie, and my mom turns to me, and she's always been like a, you know, really gung-ho about fighter jets and things, and she turns to me and says, gosh, Matt, wouldn't that be fantastic to go in there and be a, a fighter pilot? I mean, can you imagine going Mach 1 and doing all this stuff? <coughs> Apparently, I turned to her and said, Mom, Dad, if it's all the same to you, I just think I'll get a desk job. <laughs> what kid says that? <laughs> True story. <laughs> no, but in reality, dreams and aspirations, I did have a dream of always actually being a, a, an opportunity to teach at a university. Is the first thing I told Melanie, actually, when we had our first date. Um, and uh, the opportunity almost slipped me by. And I, I want to use it as an illustration of what I talked about with an agreement. When we first got married in 2005, the housing prices were going up like crazy. And we were fearful that if we didn't jump in, we'd never be able to own a house. And so we decided to buy a home, and it tied us up financially to a real certain number. And what I didn't realize at the time, it also tied us up both to a specific career to be able to support the finances that we had signed up for. And what didn't appear on the paperwork that we signed, and the paperwork, as you guys know, is thick, it never said in there that I was going to forego the opportunity to go back and get a PhD. That I was going to forego the opportunity to go back and, and chase this. So by accepting this, this now went away. And it was only through fortunate circumstance and an amazingly understanding and supportive group uh, in my business setting and personally that that opportunity was afforded me again. And yes, many of you have seen the pictures around town um, and have made fun of the fact, look, I was teaching cash flow analysis. So that was saying we were talking about the third cash flow, but it looks like I don't have a finger in the picture. Yeah. <laughs> so what were your dreams and aspirations growing up? And, and have you let go of some of those? And, and where are you at in that journey? Second, interests and passions. What are you passionate about? What is it that when you do it, you lose track of time? <coughs> You need to find out those things are, right? Interests and passions are real key to who we are. We're hardwired into doing certain things that are a derivative of the things we like to do. How about skills and talents? I always love sports. It's a great analogy for life. Anybody know who that is? Of course, Michael Jordan, right? Now, by all accounts, he's a great physical athlete. He's 6'6", he's got amazing athleticism, and so on and so forth. But so do a lot of the people that he played against in the NBA that year. What everybody that's documented his career has talked about was his differentiating factor was the ability for him to be mentally tougher than everybody else on that court for a longer period of time. He could narrow in and he could focus. That's why he wanted the ball at the end of the game. That's why he could knock that shot down more times than he missed it. He's got skills and talents. Physical skills and talents, mental skills and talents, which made him arguably the greatest basketball player that ever played. Now, those things are also honored in other trades. If he didn't have a, a passion for basketball like he did, then maybe he would have applied it to a different passion, like he does with golf. And that also makes him good at golf. But just for fun, I think those things would also be honored in another trade. Like, let's say, crab fishing. Okay? If you take Michael Jordan as a crab fisherman, <laughs> he has the physical ability to move those things around for 18 and 20 hours at a time, and he has the mental fortitude to not put his foot into a net and go overboard to his personal demise, right? Point is, it's kind of joking, but interests and passions, skills and talents, they kind of intertwine, but his skills and talents were uniquely qualified for where he found himself. What are your skills and talents? So let's take a moment. There's the next, uh, the next worksheet in your deck here is asking about your dreams and aspirations, your interests and passions, and your skills and talents. And there's a few questions that kind of can lead you down a quick reflection on each. So let's take a few minutes and let's do that with stuff, but we'll keep the things going. Again, this is just kind of a starter for you. It may take some more time for, for you guys to reflect on it. And that was the warm-up act for self-discovery. <laughs> Here's where the real heavy lifting happens. How many of you have ever, ever been back to a place, seen a picture, smelled something that took you back immediately to a point in time in your life? And when you did, you, made, you had this immediate comparison between who you were then and who you are now, right? And there's kind of one of those, you, know, you see a picture of yourself two years ago or five years ago, or you smell something, all of a sudden it takes you back. Well, that's really valuable because you have the ability to see 
the progress that you've made in life. You know, we see each other in the mirror every day, right? And so it's hard to see those differences. But when you take a snapshot and then compare it to a difference in time, it becomes a lot easier to do. Now, what if we have the ability to say, look, we're going to stand where we are today, and instead of looking at something in the past, we're going to actually look at what we look like at the end of our lives, or what we desire to look like and be at the end of our lives. I call that the exercise of the expose and the epitaph. Okay? So the expose, short write-up, profiling who a person is. And if you're being honest with yourself, then it's really an authentic documentary of who you are and what you're all about. The epitaph is a brief writing following death of who an individual was, right? So let's talk about this for a second. The expose. Here's a quick assignment. Don't do it yet. You're a writer. In 200 words or less, total transparency and self-honesty, who are you? I don't know about you, but I have a hard time answering that question without starting it by saying, I am a, and then put in my job occupation. Somewhere along the line, that just became synonymous with my identity. I am a finance guy. I am a teacher. But really, I know that I'm far more than those things. I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm all these other things, but it's the first way. It's just how it is. Now, to compare it, let's take a look at the epitaph. You're writing your own epitaph, 200 words or less. Write it based on how you would like to be remembered. In other words, your aspired self. Who did you end up being by the end of your life? So go ahead. I'll give you just a couple of minutes. Just try to even write the first line for each and see what you can come up with. All right, I know you can't do full justice to that kind of in a few minutes, but while you're finishing up, I'm going to read you a quote. I love this quote. This is a great quote by a gentleman named J.M. Barry. You might know him as the creator, actually, of Peter Pan. The life of every man is a diary in which he means to write one story and writes another. And his humblest hour is when he compares the volume as it is with what he hoped to make it. And I think that pretty much summarizes the gap between who we are today and who we want to be. For my part, um, I've been coping with this gap between who I am and who I want to be by putting some letters to key people in my safe at home. So that if something happens to me, something they can come out and the letters can be read. So, not to sound morbid, something happens to me on the drive home. A week later, you guys are all inconvenienced again and have to come to a funeral. There's dessert. <laughs> See, this is the hometown crowd thing. You just can't expect this. So much. The reality is, maybe Melanie would be brave enough to come up and say a few kind words about me. Hey, you know, he was a good husband. He was a good father. You know, he loved his kids. He was this, he was that. And then at some point, she'll go to the safe and she'll pull the letter out of the safe and she'll open it. And she'll read it. And paraphrasing, it'll say something like, you know, Melanie, um, I'm... I'm sorry that I didn't keep courting you like we did before we got married, after we got married, because I was so busy with so many important, but yet not important things. And I'm sorry that we didn't talk as much about the fact that you were the motivation behind all the things that I was trying to go do, and love for you and for the kids. And so on, and so on, and so on. And given my beliefs, I'm looking down on this as my deceased soul, and I'm asking myself one simple question. Why did I need a letter in my safe when my life should have been doing the talking for me? Answer is, I need to close that gap on authenticity. So, the world we play in, worldly perspective, it's where life's lived. It's beautiful, but it's got temptations and competing priorities and invitations and these things we've got to navigate through. Two, we grow, we, grow, we gain self-perspective. We know who we are and we know where we're going, where we're desiring to be. We're never going to get there. Life's a journey. We've heard it a million times. It's cliche, but it's true. There's no destination. It's just this desire to be moving in a direction that we're conscious of, right? So the third step now is taking that knowledge, that self-perspective, and imposing that into the world in a way that's authentic to who you are. How many people feel they're wise here? How many people are wise? Come on, George, raise your hand. I know you're so <laughs> okay, well, Jim Stovall from Wisdom of the Ages says this about wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to relate and apply learning to the real world. 
If that's true, we're going to find out how wise we really are. Okay? To become what we are capable of becoming is the only end in life. Robert Louis Stevenson. So I'm going to offer up four different tools, if you want to call them such, to try to find and, and perpetuate authenticity between who you are and the world. Time, prioritization, balance, and habits and routines. So where do you spend your time today? Right or wrong, that's what you're prioritizing, because you're trading that sacred resource of time for it. Rich, poor, tall, short, strong, not, whatever, we only get 24 hours in a day. All of us get the same. We're all on a level playing field from that perspective. So what do you spend your time on? Second question is, what would you like to spend your time on? Meaning, or what should you be spending your time on? If you look at that epitaph, and that says, this is who I desire to be by the time I face the end, right? The end of my days. What are the things that you should be spending your time on now if that's the end you seek? And that's a different set of time frames, if you will, or, or elements normally than the things you're spending your time on now. Stephen Covey says it this way, the key is not to prioritize what's on your schedule, but to schedule your priorities. Third one, balance. This has been an elusive thing for me, this whole concept of balance. To me, balance in an overly analytical mind is equal time being spent in all of these different areas, right? Um, Thomas Merton, who's a writer that I enjoy reading, says, happiness is not a matter of intensity, but of balance, order, rhythm, and harmony. So over my journey this last decade to try to get answers to these questions that were swirling in my mind, here's my own new definition of balance. Balance is giving time to things commensurate with their true importance, not societal or worldly imposed importance. Meaning the importance that I say that they have as a result of my own knowledge of who I am, not the world's statement about what's important. And lastly, habits and routines. John Maxwell, leadership expert, says, you will never change your life until you change something you do daily. The secret of your success is found in your daily routine. Let me give an example. Earlier, I talked about how I was really you know, starting to look at my value in terms of the balance sheet, my personal net worth. Matter of fact, at one point early on in my career, you know, I was contributing to the 401k plan, I was doing other investments, I thought I could have enough time to be a day trader while doing a full-time job, and all these types of things. And every day I would go at the end of the day and I would look at my E-Trade account balance. And if it was up, it was up. And I felt good, I felt successful, I, I had done good. And if it was down, I was in the dumps. I was like, geez. And all of a sudden, this metric was starting to consume my life. First off, it was consuming all my time and my focus, and ultimately, it was becoming who I was. And when I finally gained some of the perspectives that I sought out answers in life and started applying this framework for my own self, I was able to step back from it and realize, you know what? At the end of the day, I don't want to be defined by that. So I changed this habit routine. I only look at it once a quarter now. I don't look at it daily. I don't look at it monthly. I don't get the statements. I don't get anything. I look at it once a quarter. I do a deep dive once a quarter, and I say, great. It's often enough that if it's not going to go off a cliff, but it's not daily to where it's become my DNA and who I am. And it took me a long time developing the habits and routines to fill other things with that to do it. And again, that's not a shot at anybody that spends time doing that. If you like doing it, great. It wasn't healthy for me. That doesn't mean it's not healthy for you. I don't know if the stock market was up or down yesterday. And again, that's how far removed I've come from that. One last thought on this before I ask you guys to do a little exercise. An old Cherokee told his grandson, my son, there is a battle between two wolves inside us all. One is evil, it's anger, resentment, jealousy, greed, inferiority, lies, and ego. The other is good, it's joy, peace, love, hope, humanity, kindness, empathy, and truth. The boy thought about it, and he asked himself, or his grandfather, Grandfather, which wolf wins? The old man quietly replied, the one you feed. Make sure you're feeding the right wolf that you want to win with your habits and routines. There's a form in your packet right here that does, goes through those four tools, if you will. The top left is, what am I currently spending my time on? The top right is, what would I like to spend my time on? Or based on, what should I be spending my time on based upon my epitaph? The bottom left might be an area that's needing some balance in your life. So if you've identified an area that needs balance, then go to the bottom right and add or remove a couple of habits and routines that you think might help you get there. Let's take a few minutes for this. Feel free to finish up if you want. I'm going to offer a few 
lessons that I talk about uh, that, that helped me on this journey of kind of trying to find more authenticity in my life that may, may resonate for you. One of them is which are the right opportunities to pursue in life? I mean, we talked about it earlier, skills and talents, interests and passions, dreams and aspirations. I would, I would offer that what I've observed from mentors and people that have invested in me is that where your skills and talents, your interests and passions and your dreams and aspirations converge on opportunities in life, that's an authentic place for you. And so if that's a helpful uh, way to kind of uh, cue in or, or, or you know, litmus test to apply when you're facing different opportunities, that might be a good way to think about it. Another one is, do you know how to say no, right? And that's a challenge. Uh, I like saying yes to everybody, right? Yes, I'll do this, yes, I'll do that, yes, I'll do that. I know there's many of you that are the same way. Uh, and it's especially hard when it's being asked by friends or family. Maybe some of you are here tonight because I or my wife invited you to be, and you're like, yes. And maybe you really wanted to say no, and now you can, right, in the future. <laughs> but the reality is, you know, we have to learn how to say no. And because keeping the doors of opportunity perpetually propped open on too many fronts is exhausting. And it's diluting to who we are as human beings. And so I think learning to say no, and say it in a loving manner, or say it in an authentic way, it is what it is. If it's coming from a place of, of mastery and your own authenticity, then I think you can let the chips fall where they may, right? It just takes practice to, to get better at it. This is a big one. How much is enough? Um, I'm not talking about money per se. I'm just talking about in anything you do. How do you govern or moderate how much you put into something? I have students come to my office all the time asking me this. How much is enough studying? Is eight hours enough for the midterm? Is 10? Is 20? Here's the way I would go through it. The challenge is this with all of us. More effort and time normally equals a desired outcome. If I practiced more, then I played better in the basketball court. If I studied more, in general, I would get a better grade. So the, the deductive clause or conclusion, basically the implied but false conclusion, is that we can control outcomes by the time we put into them. But the reality is, at best, we can probably influence them, right? So the solution here is how much is enough is this. We have to combine the perspective we've gained with wisdom. We have to know when we are doing our best, which takes self-perspective. And then we have to know that and do that without mortgaging other more important aspects of our lives. Right? And that's, I think, a real important ingredient to being able to do that. Kill the battery. Another one, focus on what you can control and then let go of the outcome. This was a big one for me. I, I worry about all the things I can't control, or I have for many years. And so this has just become kind of one of those habits and routines that I've got to ask myself, give myself permission to let go of. I love this quote by Mark Twain. I've lived through some terrible things in my life, some of which actually happened. <laughs> So let's talk through uh, one last thing. I call this I call this the then what phenomenon. Then what? How many of you ever bought a lottery ticket? Have you ever stopped and thought, what would I do if I won the lottery? It's kind of fun to ask, right? Okay, so let me tell you. Here's what I would do if I won the lottery. It's not that fun. I win the lottery. I pay my 50% in taxes, federal, state, all these things. Then I go ahead and I put some into in some investments and create passive income for to be able to create freedom in my life. And then I probably would buy a newer car, not a new car, because I'm so proud of my 200,000 mile car, so I might buy a newer car, and so on and so forth. And then, you, you know, you can kind of go down, like go travel the world, see different places, would love to experience some different things, and that provides an opportunity. But no matter how many times you answer it, if I offer the question, then what? At some stage, you're going to get down the list, and it's going to be this law of diminishing returns, meaning, you know what? At some point, there's only so many places to see. There's only so many great dinners that you can have. There's so many, so, and at some point, you're looking for something bigger. You're looking for something more. Something that you can't consume your way to. All right, fine. You might say, Matt, the lotto is an easy example of that. All right, fine. Let's take another morbid one then. Back to the car accident. Okay? On the way home, I'm in a car accident. This time I'm not killed, but I am paralyzed. And as somebody that loves to run and be outdoors and be active, that's, that's daunting to me to think about. And so aside from the um, anger that I would have immediately following that, and assuming I could get past that anger, 
Um, then there'd be a reality of things. Uh, can I go continue doing my jobs physically? If I, I would it inhibit my ability to do those things? And therefore, would it inhibit my ability to provide for my family? And would that have a financial strain and then a marital strain and so on and so forth? And you can see the dominoes. But let's assume I can get through all of that, even with these catastrophic circumstances. At the end of it, at some point, my life stabilizes, and then I'm back to the same question. Then what? Then what? See, what I would say is the thing I thought I was looking for was success. I always thought I could get it. I thought it was something I got. I thought it was something that if I worked hard enough, I received it. What I've come to find is it's actually what you get. And I call that gaining significance. Step one, we talked about the world. It was seductive. It's beautiful. It's opportune. It's our field of play. It's where we live. It's where we play. Gaining self-perspective. That's who we are. Well, who we are today and who we aspire to be. Gaining authenticity is our ability to apply who we are to the world in which we live, not the other way around. See, the world will answer those questions for who we are if we let it. Or we can decide for ourselves. This last step, though, is even once you've attained authenticity, or on the journey to it, it's never, I guess, an end destination, it's a process. At some point, you still ask that question of, I can't get, I can't consume my way to perpetual joy, peace, and contentment. There's something bigger here that I'm after. So, what is it? Anybody recognize that? April 14, 1912, Titanic, an unsinkable ship. Maiden voyage. It's all well chronicled, I don't need to tell you guys the story, but the bottom line is there were a ton of people that would be, by those worldly standards, considered the elite. Had been very successful in their careers. Powerful, lords, this, that, both in terms of resource and prestige, power, all of these things. And then we had an iceberg. And then the morning of uh, April 15th looked more like that. We know how it went. We've all seen the three-hour movie. I won't keep it three hours. Then what's the point? If everything we've gained in our life, the fruits of our work, can be taken away by things that are out of our control, then what is the point? I remember a sermon uh, that I heard a long time ago where they asked this hypothetical question, which is kind of why I like to use the Titanic as the backdrop for this example. It resonated to me. If you knew that you were on the Titanic and you knew the fate that was going to bestow that ship that night, to fall that ship that night, but you couldn't get off the ship, you knew you had to, had to face the fate with everybody else, would you spend April 14th rearranging the deck chairs and organizing them? <laughs> Reality is, any effort that you put into that, of course, goes down with the ship. But I can't tell you how many times in my own life I've rearranged deck chairs on a sinking ship. And many times it was thinking that I was going to get something in return for that effort. So instead, I've kind of come to learn this that I wanted to offer and see if this resonates for you. Success. It's about what we get or achieve, and it's a great thing. There's nothing wrong with success. It can lead to enjoyment and happiness. But it's got a downside. It's temporary. It happens, and then it's over. It has another limitation. It can be taken away. It's beyond our control. Let me show you the journey I had to go through. For many time, years, I felt like, oh, you know what? Success would be being able to be financially independent to where I didn't have to go to work if I didn't want to. And that's a success. But if I think that that's going to bring me the success that I was envisioning when I said it or was chasing it of having perpetual joy, peace, contentment, and happiness, I was wrong. Because, see, the reality is I could build up this big stable full of cash or retirement fund or a portfolio of properties and get a whole bunch of passive income. And at the end of the day, it can all be taken away. It's beyond my control. I could be sued. I could have a situation happen. A uh, natural disaster come, takes all the homes, whatever. So if I find my success in my homes or my estate or the market, it can be taken away. All right, fine. So, yeah, we're, we know, Matt, we're not supposed to, to, to bestow tangible things. All right, so if I find my success in my wife and my kids, they could be taken away too. Tragically, they could leave. If I find my success solely in that, my identity in that, that can be taken away. Okay, fine. So, so what is it that actually can't be taken away? Whereas success is about getting, significance is about giving. And what you've already given cannot be taken away. Let me offer you a few quotes and see if this makes any sense. 
What we've done for ourselves alone dies with us, but what we've done for others and, uh, uh, and the world remains and is immortal. Albert Pike. Winston Churchill said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Garth Brooks, any country fans in the house? <laughs> you aren't wealthy until you have something that money can't buy. It's funny, in this church we heard a story, and I want to share it with you, because I thought it was a great example of a significant finding, and for me it really drove home the point that I've experienced over the last handful of years as I've been on this self-journey. Um, there was a story that was given by a daughter of a man who's now deceased. The gentleman's name was Bob, and Bob was a, um, he was, in 1947, he had traveled to China on a summer mission trip to share his faith with people in, in that country. And toward the tail end of that trip, um, he, was, uh, he was sharing his faith, and, and a, a young girl, 10, 8, 9, somewhere in that range, um, took to the faith, went home, and pronounced the faith with her family, and was subsequently beaten and brought back to the place where the actual um, sharing of the faith had taken place. And one of the workers at the camp that Bob was speaking at brought her and rushed her over to him and said, and looked at Bob and said, you know, told her of the situation. And Bob said to her, what are you going to do about it? She said, no, no, no. The question is not what I'm going to do about it. The question, Bob Pierce, is what are you going to do about it? Now, Bob Pierce, at that moment, was about to go back on a plane and come to the United States. So he took the last bit of money that he had in his pocket, he took it out and he handed it to him. He said, here, care for her with this money, and when I get back, I'm going to send more. And it's thought that the seeds that became world vision were planted that day, and that business model, if you will, that nonprofit now sponsors over 4.3 million children some 70 years later, all from one significant act that took place 70 years ago. All right. Now, it's not him at the end of the day. So let's talk about this for a second. We said authentic living was skills and talents, interests and passions, and dreams and aspirations. That leads to authentic living. So how do we find something then that can't be taken away? How do you find that significant thing that we're looking for? My mentors have taught me, and I've found, it's from including the needs of others in the framework. It's where your skills and talents, your interests and passions, your dreams and aspirations meet with the needs of others. Now, oftentimes people think that giving is a financial thing. I gotta be successful so I can give, and that's okay. Giving financially, there's nothing wrong with that. But what I'm talking about here is more of looking at your life as an opportunity to weave the decisions and the paths you choose to where you view yourself as somebody that serves the needs of others through the things that you're uniquely gifted at, that you're skilled and talented with, that you are interested and passionate in doing, and that you've somehow dreamed and aspired to, to do. And so it's more of a melding of your life with this as opposed to a singular act or a singular generous gift. This one's often talked about, but it drove the point home. So I said, you know what, let's be cliche. A kid's walking alone on a beach where a bunch of live fish have washed ashore, picking fish one up one at a time, tossing them back into the sea. A man nearby is looking at this going, oh my gosh. A man walks up to the kid and says, there's too many fish to throw back. You can't possibly make a difference. Kid picks up another fish, throws it back, says to the man, I made a difference to that one. I know you've heard it. You might have heard it with the starfish story. At the end of the day, I think it really drives that point home. It's not how big the significant act is. It's that you made the significant act. It's that you found the needs of others somewhere in that framework. I've come to find that what I thought I was seeking with success, I found with significance. And it just took putting the needs of others in the framework as well for it to happen. So... Quick last uh, homework assignment for you guys here. Just a couple of minutes you find me for this one. Uh, take a look at gaining significance. And there's two little buckets here. What are three things, and if you don't have three, that's fine. What are some things in your life that cannot be taken away? And then at the bottom, what are there, are there some opportunities for significance in your life that have come to mind as a result of us sharing? So take just a couple of minutes and try to, to list a couple of things under each. All right, let's bring this one home. So this is, I'm going to tie it all together here. Wrap up here in the next 10 to 15 minutes. Get out and get some of those desserts. We started off saying, I believe it's not dying when people are afraid of something else, something more unsettling and more tragic than dying frightens us. We're afraid of never having lived, coming to the end of our days with the sense that we were never really alive, that we never really figured out what life was for. I would offer that what I found through those mentors and through this journey has been that the answer to this living life to the fullest is seeking significance in life. 
seeking opportunities to give your interests and passions, skills and talents, dreams and aspirations, where the intersection uh, is with the needs of others. Whereas success is about getting, it can be taken away, out of the control, temporary. Significance is permanent. It's something that you get that permanent benefit of the peace, the joy, the contentment that you might have been seeking when you were looking for the success. Here's an interesting way, I guess, of maybe illustrating this and try, trying to drive the point home. If you take this, this line here, where we are today at the passage of time into the future, and you look at that triangle above it, let's say that that's the trajectory of somebody's life. That their life is going to continue to grow, and they're going to grow, and they're going to invest in themselves, and, and try to answer questions in a way in life, and, and improve their life. But then say we decided to, to interject something significant. In other words, we participated in their life and were significant to them in some way. We the increased trajectory of life due to a significant act that's being done today. All of a sudden, their life took on a new trajectory. We might be coaching them in a little league game, right? I remember so many coaches over the years that, that I grew up with that had an impact on my life. Teachers, mentors, <coughs> parents of friends, friends, etc., etc. They all had a role. Many of them don't even know they have a role because it's not something that is often talked about in those terms, right? But it was significant. It changed the trajectory of my life. So therefore, the legacy impact of significance is that delta. The delta between what their life would have been and what their life became because you were involved in it, right? One of the most profound ways I can illustrate this is with a quick story. Um, Melanie and I, both our children are adopted, as many of you know. Um, we, uh, when we were adopting Hunter, um, who, well, we didn't know it was Hunter at the time, but when we were going to adopt Hunter, we met with an adoption attorney. And the adoption attorney uh, had a really profound way of looking at his life. Go into his office, he, like me, likes to talk. And so uh, we sat there, and I just listened, and I was, I was in awe. He said, you know, I, I view my life as an attorney in, in helping adoptions in a really weird way, Matt. And it's, it's important that my clients understand the way I view it. I said, okay. He says, you see, I, I can go and, and do some other things uh, with my attorney skills, but I've got a real interest in children and families, and I'm passionate about it. I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, okay, look, I'm a religious man. This is him talking. I'm a religious man. I believe that the evil one puts chaos into these situations, meaning an unplanned pregnancy, something that's going on, a rape, whatever the circumstance is. I believe that's the evil one putting chaos into the circumstances, saying, there, what are you going to do about that? And he looked at his life and his role of saying, I'll tell you what I'm going to do about that. I'm going to open an adoption of practice. I'm going to use my skills and talents as an attorney and my interests and passions for children and families. And I'm going to find great families. And I'm going to support the great families and the courage that have the, the, uh, the, the, the guts to be able to put that child up for adoption. And I'm going to find a marriage there that works to perpetuate that kid's best interest. And one by one, we're going to put organization and love and happiness back into a chaotic situation. And I go, that's, that's really awesome. I mean, I've never actually heard it described that way. And he goes, yeah. And he says, and they're going to have kids one day. And they're going to know that story because they know that they were adopted. And then they're going to move to the next step. And their kids are going to be better because they were brought up that way. And so on and so forth. And he says, and one day, 200 years from now, when I'm gone, long gone, I will have changed the path of the way the world went because I chose to do this in my career. <laughs> I was like, now that's clarity about significance. Ultimately, is there any better legacy than leaving a path to a place that gives somebody the opportunity to live life to the fullest? Mahatma Gandhi said it this way, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. So, this one's kind of cool. I have to share at least one slide this way because if I'm being authentic to who I am, it's an important part of my framework, of my authenticity. So we talked about this slide, skills, talents, interests, passions, dreams, and aspirations colliding with the needs of others. That's significance, right? And I've told you so far tonight that I, in my journey with my mentors and everybody that's invested in me, I've not found anything that I can get that I can hold on to that's permanent, except one thing. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. It's 
the only thing I found that I can get that actually can't be taken away. And I share it not because I'm trying to overtly preach at you, but I share it as an important component of my own authentic framework in case it's something that you might need to consider for yours. All right, I told you I love movies. We're getting to the home stretch here. We're wrapping it up. Braveheart. Everybody, anybody seen Braveheart? Some, some people too gory for, right? Let me set a quick context. Mel Gibson's character here, William Wallace, right? The Scots. Um, they were fighting against the oppression of the English. The English had, you know, uh, all of the, uh, the trappings of the day. They had mounted uh, soldiers on, on horseback. They had all the gear, uniform, everything else. The Scotsmen who were trying to fight for their freedom uh, were just kind of a motley looking crew, right? Um, the king was trying to basically breed out the Scots and all this stuff. They were torturing their women, they were killing and murdering, and so on and so forth. And there's a really poignant scene at the, in the middle of the movie where William Wallace, who's standing there facing the English army, and they're about to have a battle, turns to his fellow Scotsman and says, Will you fight? And one of the Scot Scottish soldiers says, Fight? Against that? No, we will run. And we will live. <laughs> to which Wallace's character responds, I fight and you might die. Run and you'll live. At least for a while. And many years from now, dying in your bed, would you be willing to trade all the days from this day to that for one chance to come back and tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they won't take our freedom? You see, I would argue that we all face an enemy. They're not mounted English soldiers. They're not an army that's standing across a battlefield from us. They take a much more auspicious approach. It's inauthentic living. It's this challenge that we face, this place that can rob us of our time and instead says, you know what, I'll leave regret and broken dreams in, a, in, a, in my wake. A place where you say, you know what, I'm going to take life and I'm just going to pass it by. And I'm going to take, take and dangle this over here thinking it's the destination. I'm going to spend months, years, even decades chasing it only to find that it wasn't truly what I thought it was. But there's another way. With your gain perspective of understanding the world for who it is, what it is, more importantly, understanding who you truly are, you can impose your will onto the world as your field of play in a way that's authentic to you. And in so doing, you can also choose to invoke the needs of others into that framework. And I think you might just find, and many of you have because you've been my mentors, many of you, you found that significant place, that place that has the perpetual joy and peace and contentment. It allows you to trade your time for authentic living. Benefits, no regret, just living life to the fullest. No temporary happiness, just peace, joy, a contentment that can't be taken away. On top of it all, you build a legacy, right? presenting an example and a path for others to find. So, my closing thoughts to you would be this. Where in life could you be living more authentically? Try to identify one area to focus on. Maybe one area that's come through this. I know that we had to zip through kind of the worksheets. That was just kind of out of respect to make sure that we don't keep everybody locked up here all night. But if you have the time to pause and think about it, maybe go back and revisit them in the days ahead and say, you know what? Where is there an area as I look at this honestly with myself that it's about? It's not for my benefit, it'd be for your own. Second thing, maybe there's one opportunity for significance that presents itself for you in the next seven days. A place where you go, you know what? I know my interests and passions, skills and talents, dreams and aspirations collided right here with this opportunity for this situation that has others as the beneficiary. Try it out and see what you might find. Get going. Now is the time. After all, it's about time. Thank you very much.